this morning to the book of Matthew, chapter number 6. <clears throat> Matthew, chapter number 6, and I want you to find verse number 9. We have been in these first couple of weeks of 2019 preaching on the one thing that I believe can really change or raise the spiritual temperature in our lives. We make a lot of resolutions when a new year comes and we want to do a lot of different things. But in 2019, I've committed to the Lord that I want to pray more. Not only do I want to pray more in quantity, but I want to pray better in quality. I don't just want to offer up more prayers, but I want to offer up better prayers. I don't know about you, but when I'm left to my own devices, my prayers turn into one big pity party. Can I get a witness on that this morning? Oh, Lord. You just don't even know how bad things are in my life, and I sure do wish you would fix them. But we're asking the Lord to teach us to pray selfless prayers. Praying for others will change our lives. Can I tell you something? There's probably somebody in your family that's lost. And if you'll start praying for that person, won't be long till you roll up on their front steps one day about 5.30. And you'll say, I just had to come by here and tell you about Jesus. When you begin to pray for things, they begin to come what is passionate to you. And the only way we're ever going to get serious about God's business is, is if we start praying to God and asking Him to help us be what we need to be. Because you understand something about prayer. Prayer is not about moving God off of His spot. Hebrews 13, 7 says uh, He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He told the Israelites, he said, I, the Lord, your God, change not. God's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. So prayer's never about me getting God off of his spot over here with me, but prayer's always about me getting off my spot and getting where God wants me to be. Prayer changes our lives. And uh, the disciples at this point in, in Matthew, it's not recorded here, it's recorded in Luke chapter 11. The disciples have asked Jesus, they've said, Lord, we want you to teach us to pray. We want you to teach us to pray properly. Now, you know this because we've been, if you've been here on Sunday nights with us, we've been going through the Gospel of John. And, and you know that Jesus is traveling back and forth between the northern region of Galilee and the southern region of Judea. And when Jesus is recording these, or when he's speaking these words that are recorded in Matthew chapter number 6, Jesus has just now traveled back from Judea and he's going to Galilee. And those of you who've been here on Sunday nights, you ought to know this. On the way from Judea to Galilee, Jesus passes through the region of... Amen. Man, that was, that was a lot of people answered that. Praise the Lord. And see, people tell me sometimes, they say, Preacher, if you ask people the next week what you preached on the last Sunday, they wouldn't even be able to tell you. You know what I say? Them people are a bunch of liars. Amen? Y'all know, don't you? He traveled through Samaria. He encountered a Samaritan woman. Not only did he encounter the Samaritan woman, but we learned last Sunday night that he encountered a whole village of Samaritan people, and their lives were drastically changed. And then Jesus travels on into Galilee. But John says something about Jesus when he travels from Samaria into Galilee. He says that Jesus made a statement. And this is the statement Jesus made. A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country. You know who liked Jesus? A whole lot of people. You know who didn't like Jesus? The people that he's raised around. Now, there's, now most of y'all probably don't want a new pastor. There's probably some people in my family that want a new pastor. Amen? 
They're like, man, we've been around him since 1993 and we're just flat tired of him. We think it's time for somebody else. Amen? But the people that Jesus was the closest to were the people who rejected him. His popularity was slowly declining. Why would Jesus' popularity be declining? Hmm. Could it be that he uh, says things like what he says in Matthew chapter number 6? When you pray, don't pray like those hyper super spiritual religious people up there at the temple who think they've got it all figured out because truly they don't know nothing. They're a bunch of whitewashed tombs. Now, nowadays we don't say whitewashed tombs. What do we say? Well, you might call them a sorry sap sucker. Right? Amen. You might call them uh, worthless as a uh, pig's tail. Might say that, right? Uh, might say dumb as a, dumb as a, a nail. Y'all, y'all got those phrases that you use to just describe people who are worthless, ignorant, whatever you want to say. Well, Jesus had those too. He called them whitewashed tombs. He said, when you pray, don't pray like the Pharisees who stand on the street corner, they say their prayers out loud, and they want everybody who walks by to say, oh, man, what a man of God. What a prayer warrior. I believe if that man could touch heaven, anybody can. Can I tell you something? The people that you think can pray, a lot of times can't pray. And the people you never hear pray out loud are actually the ones who can ring the bells of heaven. Amen? It's not in our words. It's not in our excellence of speech. But it's... But but, but prayer is so much more about what's on the inside of a man than what is on the outside of a man. So Jesus ridicules these Pharisees for for really three reasons. Number one, he ridicules them for how they give their alms to the poor. When they do kind things to the poor, they get way back and they stick that money out as far as they can so everybody around them can see what they're doing. Now, we don't do that today, but here's what I do say. Every time you do something nice, guess where you don't have to put it? Amen. Facebook. You know what I really believe? If you do something kind and you go put it on Facebook, it ain't even kind no more. It's just self-promotion. Amen. Call it what it is. So that's what the Pharisees did back in those days. They gave alms. They prayed out loud. And they fasted. You know what they did when they fasted? They didn't wear their normal clothes. They wore their raggedy clothes. And they smeared ash all over their face so people would come up to them and say, Oh, brother, so-and-so, what is wrong with you? Can I pray for you? And and he said, oh, I I just want to get in touch with God. I've been fasting. See if I can get in touch with God. Didn't accomplish anything. If you're going to fast, don't tell nobody. You're putting Roundup on your efforts if you you go out and tell everybody what you do. So Jesus said a simple thing, and I just want to sum all that up in one phrase. And, And I want you to hear what I say. He says, do what you do for God and not for men. Now, I have to be reminded of that sometime as a pastor, that I'm doing what I'm doing for the applause and the approval of an almighty God and not for the people who are around me. So we want to do what we do for God and not for men. Last week we saw in verse number 9 that we're praying to an intimate Father who is in heaven above all of the problems of this life. And we're instructed to pray firstly that God would make his name known and glorified and hallowed in this world. Today, I want to preach on this thought, four different petitions that Jesus instructs us should be a part of our regular prayer life. And if I had a thought this morning, this is what I would call it, petitions of a powerful prayer. Now, what I want to do is I want to read the entire Lord's Prayer, like we did last week, and then we're going to hone in on some verses this morning and ask the Lord to speak to us. In this manner, therefore, pray, Jesus said. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and then there's that great bible word that he concludes his prayer with and it is everybody said amen Amen. or as we good country georgia baptists like to say amen all right 
And you know what that simply means? Let it be so. Oh, that it would come to pass. Father, we ask you now this morning to help us preach with Holy Spirit anointing and conviction. God, I pray now that you would do through this time what we cannot do by ourselves, but what we can do if you'll help us now during this time. Lord, give me unction and anointing. I pray that you'd set my words on fire and speak through me now into this congregation of people. I ask it in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people in agreement said, amen. I want, to know, I want you to notice with me this morning four petitions for a powerful prayer that Jesus gives us here in Matthew chapter number 6. Number one, Jesus tells us that we need to pray for God to reign in this world. Number one, we need to pray that God would reign. Verse number 10, Jesus says, when you pray, pray this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. earlier writings compared two different cities. He called one the city of God, and in this city of God was a place where everything was as it ought to be. There was no murder, there was no greed, there was no selfishness, adultery, pride, all of the things that infect this world we live in. Augustine said there were none of those things there. He called it the city of God. And he said the reason that none of those things were there was because God was in total and complete control. When I read that in Augustine's writings, it reminds me of the passage in Revelation chapter 21 where John says he saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had passed away. And he saw a new city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for the groom. And John said in this city there was an absence of things that you and I see on a daily basis. He said there was no more dying. Just last weekend, I did two funerals in, two, in three days. I, as a pastor working at a funeral home, performing funerals, know very well that death is a part of this life. But John said, I saw a city where there was no dying. He said, I saw a city where there were no tears. He said, I saw a city where there was no sickness, no more, no more of the evil that characterizes this world because the former things had passed away. But then he wrote about another city that he called the city of man. And he said in this city, it was a city that was beset by greed, by envy, by one man wanting the things of another man, by people never having enough but always striving for more, by death, by sickness, by all of the things that characterize this world in which we live. Is there anybody in here this morning that sometimes watches the news or reads the newspaper or hears about things that are going on in the world and you just say to yourself, you don't say it out loud where anybody else can hear, but you just say to yourself, maybe in your own heart and your mind, you say something like this, how in this world could God allow that? Now listen, we don't have to be so super spiritual that we can't admit sometimes that sometimes things happen and we say to ourselves, you know, why wouldn't God stop that? Why would God allow that? What what is it that God, what what would permit God to allow something like that to happen? It's just just fleshly human reasoning. Now let me tell you what it is. It's, It's sin. Now I've heard people say, oh, it's all right to question God. I just say to people, you just better be careful of that, brother. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. When it comes to God's will and your reason, we was learning about wisdom this morning in Sunday school, you just better be careful of that questioning God's stuff, right? Because the Old Testament prophet said, who are you, old man? That, that he would be mindful of you, but he is mindful of you, and he's not mindful of you, so you could look back up at him and say, hey, God, what's going on with this, Right? So so we need to be careful about that, but if we were all honest with ourselves, we would say there are times when we wonder why it is that things happen in this world. Can I tell you something about this world? It is under the sway of the wicked one. It is under the dominion and the power of the devil. The devil is ruling and reigning in this world, but here is what the Word of God promises us, that there is coming a day when Jesus is going to bind him up hand and foot, cast him into 
into outer darkness, cast him into the lake of fire, and he will never be able to pester God's children again. His power will be destroyed. And here's what Jesus says you and I need to be praying. Lord, we're sick and tired of this old rascally, rotten devil. Y'all ever get tired of the devil? I do. Jesus says, pray that today would be the day when God would defang him, clip his wings, and cast him away for all of eternity so that we never have to deal with him again. Your kingdom come. Now here's what we understand. We're in a war with darkness. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 says that Christ has transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the beloved Son. That's what he said. But no matter how true that is, I still live in a dark, dark world. And every day I ought to pray, Lord, bind the devil hand and foot. Do you know something? When, when Paul taught about in Ephesians 6, uh, he taught about the fact that the devil is... is Firing, fiery darts. And we need the shield of faith to quench them. And do you know something? Whether you're right up next to the Lord or whether you're walking away from God, the darts are going to keep on coming. He's firing at you, man of God, woman of God, child of God. He is firing at you, hoping that he could get you to trip and stumble and fall. And what you need to be praying every day in your life is that God would stop him. You remember what happened in Job, right? The devil had to... Go to the Lord to ask for permission to touch one of God's children. And he lowered what we call the hedge of protection. And every morning I ought to pray, Lord, keep a hedge strong. You know who I am. You know I'm a man of flesh, I'm a man of weakness, I'm a, I'm a man of infirmity. And God, I pray that you would bind the devil, keep him out of my life. God, I pray that it would be in my life as it is in heaven. You know nothing bad ever happens in heaven. Did you know that? Everything in heaven is as it ought to be. And, and Jesus says you ought to pray that as it is in heaven, it would also be on this earth and in your life. Your kingdom come, your will be done Look at what he says, on earth as it is in heaven. Robert Law said this. He said, prayer is not about getting my will done in heaven, but prayer is about getting God's will done on earth. Notice Jesus didn't say, Lord, I pray that it would be in heaven as I want it to be. Lord, I pray that the desires of my heart would reach up to heaven and that God would rearrange things so that he could line up with what it is I want. No, he says... Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come, your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know where the kingdom starts? The disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, Lord, we want to know when the kingdom is coming. And we taught the kids this, this memory verse several weeks back on Wednesday night. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is not without, but he said, the kingdom of God is within, within who? Within you and me. Those of us who are saved by the grace of God. Did you know something? The kingdom of God resides within you. Therefore, Jesus calls us ambassadors for Christ. So we need to pray for God to reign. Then secondly, this morning in verse number 11, we need to pray for God to provide. Listen to what he says. I, I want to be honest with you. Out of all the phrases in the Lord's Prayer, this is my favorite one. He says in verse number 11, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, at the beginning of this prayer, Jesus told us to pray, and he said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father. Our Father. Now, let me tell you what Jesus said about the Father. Jesus said that, and there are many of you in here today, he said there are many earthly fathers. And, he, and Jesus said, earthly fathers, if your child came up to you and said, Dad, I'm hungry, what would you do? You'd feed him or her. 
I've read articles before where, where, where men were arrested for stealing. And you know what the reason they gave for stealing? And they went back and investigated and found that it was true. That men were so desperate to feed their family that they were willing to even steal so that their children might not go hungry. And here's what Jesus said. Earthly fathers, if you had a child who was hungry, you know what you'd do? You'd feed it. And here's what he says. If you who are evil... And let's just be honest, that's what we are. We're sinful flesh, right? He said, if you who are sinful know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give to those who are his own children? Can I I just testify and be honest here this morning for a moment? Several weeks ago, I preached a sermon. And everybody needs a good wife that'll hold their feet to the fire, right? If you're going to preach something, you need a wife that'll hold your feet to the fire. And so I preached a sermon several weeks ago, the first week of the year, and I had five points. I said we need to pray in a variety of ways. And the last point I said is we need to pray confidently. And we got home that Sunday night after everything was over, and and I don't even know what the conversation was. It came up about something, and, and I began to go into one of my spells of worrying. Well, my goodness, I mean, how, how are we going to take care of this? You know, I, I wasn't expecting that. I didn't, know, I didn't know about that, this, that, this, that, this, that. And my wife looks at me and she says, Now there you go, standing up on Sunday morning, talking about praying confidently and not worrying and not being anxious. And here you are, wringing your hands, not 24 hours after you preached that sermon. That's one of those times where you don't say amen, right? You say what? You say, get out of my room and go somewhere else and watch your TV show. Amen? That's what you say. Need to be preached to. That's what she told me. You know what? She's flat right. Give us this day our daily bread. If an earthly father knows how to give good gifts, how much more does your heavenly father know how to give good gifts? I want to use an example, a kind of an object lesson. I want you to turn with me this morning to Exodus chapter number 16. Real quickly, I just want to read a couple of verses, and I want to make a point that I believe will bless your heart. Sometimes I read things in the Word of God, and I just I say, mm, that's good right there. And this is one of those times. I was in Exodus chapter number 16, talking about praying for God to provide. Exodus chapter number 16, verse number 4. And Eric will throw it up behind us too. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you and the people and shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them. That I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. You know what he's saying? I'm going to test them, see if they can do what I say. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. You know why? Because on the Sabbath you don't gather food. So Jesus says every day you get enough prov- or excuse me, God tells the children of Israel, he says every day you get enough provision for that day except on the sixth day. Because you're not working on the Sabbath. So on the sixth day I want you to get twice as much so you can feed yourself on that day and the next. Real simple commandment. Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, verse number 6, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you complain against us? Moses said, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your complaints which you make against him. Then Moses spoke to Aaron, say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. Verse number 12, he said, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, at twilight you shall eat meat, in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it was that quails came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. And you know what they called it? Manna. You know what manna means if you study in the Hebrew? It means, what is it? 
Now, boy, you thought that song, Holy Manna, was a lot more spiritual than that, right? But you're literally singing, Holy, what is it? <laughs> right? Amen? Every morning they woke up and there was dew on the ground. Lifted the dew and there lay the manna. In the evening they ate quail. Did you notice something at the beginning of that passage? The Bible says they grumbled and complained. They said, you know, back in Egypt we had to work hard, but at least we ate good. We didn't travel around in this wilderness burning up hot, got sunburned. We ain't got strong enough SPF, you know, walking out here in the sand. You know, life wasn't so bad back in Egypt. Aren't you glad this morning that in spite of your griping, grumbling, moaning, and complaining, God doesn't hold back from you, but he continues to give to you no matter what your attitude is. I'm going to tell you what, I'm a grumbler and a griper and a complainer, and I'm glad he still gives me this day my daily bread. They ate manna. Oh, it wasn't long. They started complaining about that too. But I want to conclude it. Flip over to Deuteronomy chapter number 8. And just find one verse, verse number 4. Actually, I want to go back and read in verse number 2. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 2. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Look what he says in verse number 4. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Do you know what he said? 40 years had passed between Exodus chapter 16 and Deuteronomy chapter 8, and Moses looked out over all the camp, and he said, Can anybody stand up today and tell of a time when they were hungry? Can anybody stand up and tell of a time when God didn't give them exactly what they needed? And one Bible scholar this, he said this, he said, It's funny how as a Christian when you look over your, your life, you will find that not only did Jesus give you daily bread, but he gave you bread for every single day of your life. You'll look back and you'll say, Never once, not once did I ever as a child of God go without what the Father said he would provide for me. Never once. Who am I to look up to God and doubt? You know why God told them that they could only take enough provision for the day? Because he wanted them to learn to walk in obedience to him day by day by day by day by day. And you know what you'll find when you walk with him day by day? You'll walk with him for a year. You'll walk with him for five years. You'll become 70 years old. And you'll look back over the course of your life and you'll say, you know, each one was just an individual day. But now when I look back over the course of my life, I see that God was faithful in a variety of circumstances. God was faithful when I was faithful. God was faithful when I was unfaithful. God was faithful when I was content. And God was faithful when I grumbled and complained. God didn't adjust his attitude based on what I did. God was just faithful because that's who God is. He's a faithful God. He said pray that God would provide and he will. And then he said in verse number 12, something very peculiar in this prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. And then he said, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. If you were to ask people today, I was reading a, an article about this and it said if you were to ask people today what is the most common prayer, it's now not the Lord's Prayer, but it is what is called the serenity prayer. Y'all know what the serenity prayer is? Lord, I should have wrote it down because I don't really remember it. 
But it says something to the effect of, Lord, grant me the serenity to know what I can't change and know what I can change and the common sense to know the difference. All right, there's, there's, there's my translation of what that prayer says because I don't have a clue what it says. I'm going to be honest with you. There's something to the effect of, you know, I, I need to know what I can change, know what I can't change, what I can't change, I ought to let go of it, whatever, you know. And that is a perfect prayer for this world, right? You know why? Because there's, there's no real mention of any deity. There's no real mention of any gospel, no mention of sin, no mention of a need of forgiveness, no mention of any lordship, dependence on a higher power. It's just a good prayer that you could go to a Catholic church and pray, Baptist church, Muslim mosque, Jewish church. Uh, uh, place of worship, a Jewish place of worship. You could go anywhere and you could say that prayer and it would fit. It's not surprising that that prayer has become so popular. Because one thing we don't want to hear today is this, that we are sinners. We have a debt. And this phrase is where we get to the gospel foundation of what it means to be saved by the grace of an almighty God. We know it in Bible school, we call it the A of the ABCs. The first thing that a sinner must do is he must realize that he has a debt that he cannot pay on his own. You cannot save yourself, you cannot forgive yourself of the debt, you cannot remove the debt, you can't progressively pay it off. There is only one way to get rid of it, and that is it must be forgiven by an almighty God. Can I tell you something that needs to be a part of your prayer life every single solitary day of your life? You ought to say, Lord, forgive me. I don't know how you want to say it. I, I don't know how you want to word it, but it's called confession. Lord, I know I was a sinner with a great sin debt, and you forgave me of it and saved me by the grace of God, but Lord, you know me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, and you know this, that I am still prone to sin. I love that song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, because the writer says it better than I ever could. Lord, I'm prone to wonder. I'm prone to wander off the path. You know what wandering off the path is called? Sin. You know what sin creates? A debt. You know who creates debt? Jesus. You know how you can get rid of the debt that you're carrying? By giving it over to Jesus. Forgive us of our debts. It's not just something you say in salvation, but the only way to maintain a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is to constantly and continually and daily say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. The writer in Psalms said, not only should we pray for the sins that we know about, but he said, oh Lord, even cleanse me from hidden faults. Surprisingly, sometimes we sin and we don't know it. He said, Lord, cleanse me even from the things that I don't know about that I've done. Forgive us of our debts. The next word is so key. As. It means two things are happening at the same time. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Look at verse 14, and Jesus elaborated this a little further. He said, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you of your trespasses. Now there's a tendency to read that passage and to say, oh Lord, you've got to forgive other people to be saved. No, no, you don't have to do anything to be saved other than... Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive Him as not only Savior, but also as Lord of your life to give to Him everything you know about yourself at the moment of conversion. And that's what salvation is. But there's no greater indication of somebody who's been genuinely washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ than when somebody wrongs you 
and you say, I don't have to get even, I just want to forgive. Never did Jesus catch the attention of the onlookers more than when he was hanging on the cross and he looked up into heaven and he said, Father, forgive them for they do not even have a clue what it is they are doing. Jesus said, I could, I could call legions of angels. And I believe they'd have took him off the cross, they'd probably wiped out everybody standing there. I don't know, but I just imagine that's how it could and probably would have happened. Jesus said, this is what I could do. But what I am doing is I'm laying down my rights, I'm laying down my privileges, I'm laying down the will to be right and to be vindicated, and I'm saying, Father, forgive them. You know what I've found in my life? I ain't never held a grudge against somebody else. And, and it affected them. Right? I mean, I, I, I'm mad at somebody. They don't even know I'm mad. You know who's reaping the, the, the doggone punishment for it? Me. And here's what Jesus said. There's no greater indicator of somebody who's been changed by God than when you forgive other people. Jesus told a parable of this in Matthew chapter 18. He said there was a man who had a great debt. He went to the man he owed. He said, I can't pay it. He forgave him of the debt. But then there was a man who owed him a debt. It was a little debt. And he went to that man and he said, Boy, you better pay me what you owe me right now or me and you is going to be in a tussle. You know what that's called? Hypocrisy. If you could visualize what God had forgiven you of, how great would it be? Oh, my goodness. What a reality. What a self Check, that is, to think about how great a debt God has forgiven me of. And in the course of this life, people wrong me, but you know what it is? In the, in the span of eternity, it's so little and minute. Jesus said, pray every day that you'd be forgiven, but then pray also that you would be able to forgive other people. And then, fourthly, this morning, I'll be done. Pray for God to deliver. Look at verse number 13. He says, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. People often say sometimes, Preacher, why do you always say that you need to wake up in the morning and have a personal time alone with the Lord? How foolish would it be for a, a soldier to go out into battle with no armor on and then luckily make it back and say, I think I'll go put my armor on now. Somebody would look at him and they would say, for what? The threat is gone. When you wake up every morning, and I'm not going to give the devil a whole bunch of credit here this morning because I'm going to tell you something. Nine out of ten times, my enemy's not the devil. My enemy is myself. I can't get out of my own way. Does anybody else have that problem this morning? Amen. I, I can't get out of my own way. Trip over my own feet. So when I get up in the morning, I'm asking the Lord exactly what Jesus said right here. Lord, deliver me from the evil one. Lead me away from temptation because you know, Lord, if I take the reins of my life, if there's a temptation to be found, I'm going to find it. If there's a pothole to run over, I'm going to run over it. If there's a mud pile to step in, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to step in it. Lord, crucify this flesh. Put it to death that you may live through me and in me. Lead me away from the evil one, because he's everywhere in this world, seeking to destroy and devour whoever he can get his claws in. He's trying to destroy. He's trying to wreak havoc. The thief comes not but to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus come to bring what? Life? Freedom from temptation? Freedom from bondage, freedom from sin. Paul said, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You know what verse 13 is really? Verse 13 is me praying, Lord, let me live in the reality of who I am in you. You've freed me from sin. You've forgiven me of all of my sin. You've 
loose the power that the devil had over me. I'm no longer under the sway of the wicked one. I'm no longer a child of wrath or a child of disobedience, but now I'm a child of God. And literally what I'm praying every morning, you got to pray it in the morning. you got to get ready for the day that is ahead. you got to say, Lord, help me to live in the reality of who I am in Christ Jesus. May the world see that I'm not like everybody else, but I've been changed from the inside out, not by mere self-improvement, but by self-transformation, that the one who now lives in me has totally rearranged my life, and nothing has been or ever will be the same. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I don't think we truly grasp and understand the, the great battle, the spiritual war that we're in. There's no reason that Paul concluded his letter to the church at Ephesus by reminding us of the great spiritual battle that we're in. And he said, Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, put on the whole armor of God that you may able may be able to withstand in an evil day against an evil enemy. It's not hard to look around in the world in which we live and see the destruction that evil is bringing to our world. And Paul says we've been called to be luminaries, to be light in a dark dark world. So what do I need to pray every morning when I wake up? We need to pray four things. God, as it is in heaven, let it be on earth. God, give me what I need for today. Don't give me more because I'll be a glutton. Don't give me less because I'll be a pauper. But just give me exactly what I need for this day. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, I thank you that you have forgiven me. I thank you that you are forgiving me. And Lord, I pray every sin that is in my life, Lord, I want to confess it now before you, and I want you to forgive me of my sins. All of them. Sometimes you need to call them out by name. And not only that, but to say, Lord, lead me away from temptation. Lead me away from the snares that the devil sets. Lead me, as David said, in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. I really believe, every head bowed, every eye closed as they're coming this morning, I really believe this with all of my heart. Prayer is the difference in the Christian life. Prayer is what makes the difference between another nominal Christian and somebody who is truly on fire for God. Prayer is what makes the difference between somebody who lives all of their life as a shallow Christian who never comes to understand the depth of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And it's the difference between somebody who lives in the fullness and the abundance of the relationship that God has brought us into. I want to ask you something this morning. This is going to be the last Sunday I talk about prayer. I want to just ask you something this morning. How is your prayer life with the Lord? How are things when it comes to your relationship with the Lord? You say, preacher, I pray a pretty good bit. What do your prayers look like? Are they filled with pity and self-loathing? Are they filled with you begging God for this and that? There's nothing wrong with that. There are times in our lives when we need to ask God for things. Let your supplications be made known to God, Paul said. But when it comes to you and God, how's your walk? How is your prayer life? What God could do with a church full of people at Young's Grove Baptist Church who got serious about getting in touch with God. What he could do with a church full of people who would get serious about ringing the bells of heaven, getting in touch with an almighty God. You know why the Lord had to teach us to pray? Because if we prayed like we thought we ought to pray, we'd mess it all up. 
But when we get serious about praying in the will of God, here's what the Bible says. The effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man, a righteous person, a righteous child of God will avail much. I believe the greatest thing that could be said about somebody on the day of their death is this. He was a prayer warrior. She was a prayer warrior. All oh, people talk about the preachers, they talk about the singers and the teachers. But nothing could be greater said than to say that somebody can get in touch with an almighty God. That's no special privilege. It's no special calling. Jesus reminded us, or the writer of Hebrews reminded us that we can therefore now come boldly to the throne of grace. Let's get serious about getting in touch with God. Father, we love you and we thank you for the privilege of prayer. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to get serious about our prayer. Lord, we need to pray individually. We need to pray together as families, as husband and wife, as children. Lord, we need to pray without ceasing, he said to us in the Word. Give us a fervent desire for prayer. God, what you could do with prayer warriors. God, help us. We need help. It's, it's against our natural inclination, Lord. We're so busy, so consumed with so many different things. Help us, Lord. Teach us to pray. Use these messages as a catalyst, as a fire starter to help us get in touch with you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing this morning. If you want to come, if you need to come, you can. Some are already praying. As we sing this morning, let's come. Do business with the Lord. Oh.